You're tuned in to the Investing for Beginners podcast. Finally, step-by-step premium investment guidance for beginners. Led by Andrew Sather and Dave Ahern to decode industry jargon, silence crippling confusion, and help you overcome emotions by looking at the numbers. Your path to financial freedom starts now. All right, folks, welcome to Investing for Beginners podcast. This is episode 55. Tonight, Andrew and I are going to discuss some of the worst money advice you can get. Yeah, so I kind of I kind of made a list here. Um, it's kind of long. I'll try to keep it. I'll try to be concise, but you, we always know how that goes, right? So, <laughs> you know, you see it all the time, and the more and more that time goes on, the more and more people go to the internet looking for advice on how to handle their money. A lot of times you'll have people talk about, hey, I got $20,000, I got $40,000, maybe I have an inheritance, what should I do, what should I do, what should I do? And then you get all these people come out of the woodwork with all their different biases and all their different ideas and beliefs and all their personal experiences and they all kind of throw it in there and some of it can be good, but a lot of it's bad. And so we want to talk about why that's bad, what things that you'll tend to hear and how to kind of process that and make sure you don't fall into these same traps. And it's really important because this is a huge part of learning how to handle your money. And it's not even just about investing or financial freedom or personal finance. It really comes down to money itself. And if you think about all the time when we spend 40 hours a week, most of us working for money, and then a lot of us don't even spend a couple hours within our lifetime to really learn what to do after we make the money. You know, it just kind of flows in and out and it becomes just this pointless thing to put food on the table when there's actually plenty of opportunity to make that do much more for yourself than it currently does. And unfortunately, like we, you know, a lot of people like to kind of bemoan the fact that it's not really discussed in school and it's not taught in school. A lot of people don't learn about it unless either you seek it out or you're lucky to have somebody kind of bring that advice to you. And so obviously financial education is really important. And part of that is learning what are a lot of the common misconceptions, what are a lot of the kind of average pieces of advice that people give out to beginners and what how can we interpret it and kind of tackle, let's tackle it and, and really make it useful for us instead of hurtful. I'll start with an easy, quick one. Uh, you hear this all the time. You hear people say, you know, invest 10%, 20%, 50% of your income. And if we're really being honest, that's that's uh, an unrealistic thing to expect of people because percentages, when you're talking about income, that's going to vary a lot depending on how much you bring in. So somebody who makes $20,000 a year cannot invest 10% of their income because if they do that, they won't be able to pay the light bill. Whereas somebody who makes 100000 could easily invest 20% of their income and have a very cush lifestyle outside of that. So I think that's something, first and foremost, this, the percentages when you talk about investments and income and personal finance, it's one of those kind of rules of thumb that we really need to kind of put an asterisk on. I think a good general rule, Dave, we talked about in one of the episodes with the richest man in Babylon, the whole 10% rule. I think once you kind of reach over a certain point of poverty, that becomes a good rule of thumb. And, you know, there's there's ways like 401ks and IRAs that we've discussed before and different ways that you can kind of best efficiently invest that 10%. But that tends to be a good kind of general rule and obviously the more you can invest the better because it will compound into even greater amounts of wealth as time goes on another one that you hear a lot and this one drives me nuts you'll hear you know some somebody will have some sort of money to invest and and they want to find a way to make it grow and then you'll have somebody who's very excited about a certain investment and so they will talk about all the Dave can you hear the dog 
So you'll hear somebody talk about this investment and, and they'll talk it up. And because they believe in it so much, they tend to really be overexposed in the investment. And, you know, a lot of times they throw prudent concepts out the window, like diversification, dollar cost averaging, and, and they'll tend to really, you know, it, it's it's kind of outrageous. Some of the things that you'll hear that people do with the money. Uh, and they'll, they'll just freely talk about it too. You know, they'll be like, oh, well, I'm half invested in this tech stock and that tech stock. Well, that's fantastic, right? Th- and they'll, and there's always a story. And, you know, the thing about talking about whether it's a stock, whether it's an asset class like Bitcoin, if you're talking about gold, if you're talking about real estate, there's always a story that you can twist and turn to make it sound like, it's something that's going to really win in the future. And you can do the same thing with numbers and statistics. And it's really easy to weave narratives into beliefs that you want to believe yourself. And I know there's a few different biases that are in play there when, when you talk about that. And so my problem with it is not so much that, you know, people are putting thought into, you know, what a investment might do. I think obviously that's fantastic but you need to look at what kind of mental efforts being put in and and if that's the right thing to be doing so for, for example if 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 somebody says they have a product and and there's an obvious growth market for it uh say that it's it's wildly successful in the United States and they're just starting to do it in Canada and the demographics and, and the interests and all that are the same and the demands very similar. Well, then, yes, it's it's reasonable to say that that growth can expand and continue into Canada. However, just saying that doesn't alone make it a good investment. There needs to be more context and there needs to be cold, hard facts and there needs to be numbers pulled from the financial statements and data to relate, you know, what price are you paying? That's that's what we talk about when we're talking about valuations. So, you know, is this company, even though it has a bright future, is it trading at a great price? Is the growth they've had lately, has that been all natural or have they been throwing debt after debt on it just to, just to let it happen? You know, it, if they are throwing debt, to make growth happen, what happens when interest rates rise? Are you paying, you know, are you maybe getting a great deal on earnings, but not getting such a great deal on assets or sales or cash? You know, is, is, is the company have plenty of assets and earnings, but keep such little cash that one bad year could wipe them out. These are all different possibilities you really want to think about. And it always is going to mean having context and, talking on a level playing a level playing field which means numbers that are comparable with every st- business in the stock market out there so big basic numbers that we always talk about like profit assets and cash those are things that are no matter what kind of business you're running those are things that are always going to be characteristic of it and so it's really the best way to analyze it And it tells you so much more about the picture of a stock and and where it could go in the future than to say something that's so specific to a company such as, well, their growth is really blowing up internationally or, you know, profit margins here or the industry trend there. Those are all great things to know, but they're very secondary and not nearly as important as really getting the big picture and the big numbers and that's something you need to consider right away. And I I would argue that to have a conversation like that straight up at the beginning is kind of jumping the gun. And when you're a beginner who's getting advice, I think, yes, obviously, I'm, I'm very pro looking at stocks, talking about stocks, analyzing stocks, but you really need to slow down and build a foundation of basic concepts and and really have a system in place before you start dipping in the different stocks and asset classes and all those sorts of things all right so another piece of bad advice that we tend to hear a lot you kind of have some investors who like to I, i like this phrase a lot and i hear it used in places other than the investing world but where you get too cute right where you really try to 
reinvent the wheel and find ways that you think are going to make a ton of money in the future. And in reality, it's kind of just doing too much when you're kind of missing the the huge big picture. So for example, if somebody has some sort of futuristic, you know, crystal ball kind of insight that, that the United States is, is no longer going to be the place for all your money to be when it comes to the stock market. So that they might talk about, well, you should invest abroad 100%. Or maybe they have some sort of idea about a certain, I don't know, ETF or, or a, a certain macro trend that, that they're really going to try to take advantage of. And so they pour all their capital into that. It sounds like great ideas and, you know, it sounds like it's giving you an edge, but in reality, you need to understand that the way to make money in the market is to be invested in businesses. And so the thing I always like to say, which I never hear, you know, a lot, but it helps assuage my fears all the time. And, and, you know, luckily we've had a really strong market lately, so I haven't had to do that for myself. Uh, Not counting... I guess February and March. Okay, <laughs> maybe this has helped the past couple of months, but you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, we haven't seen anything close to bear market yet. But the idea that do you think the, that business will happen tomorrow? Do you think the business world will be alive tomorrow? Do you think that money will continue to flow through businesses throughout the future in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years? I think that answer is obviously yes for the majority of us. And so because we know that fact, then we can feel confident that if we are invested in businesses, that they will continue to grow and they will continue to be there tomorrow and we won't lose all of our money. Because if we're invested in enough businesses, then we know that a majority of businesses will still be around and business will still be flowing. So we can feel good about our chances. Obviously, you want to do things like diversify because you never know, you know, one or two businesses could fall through the cracks and, and really fail. We just saw Toys R Us go under. Um, so you never know. But as a general trend, business will continue. And that's how gains will happen is, is through these businesses continuing to do their thing over years and years and years and taking profits, making profits, turning those profits into more profits and, and having it just balloon up and really compound over time. So I think it's it's important to be able to distinguish between when people are trying to get too cute with their advice, if they're trying to get too complex too early, if they're try you know, if, if they're straying away from some of the basics that we always like to teach. Um things like dollar cost averaging, diversification, long term investing, and trying to buy stocks that are generally trading at a margin of safety with an emphasis on the safety. Hey you What's the best way to get started in the market? Download Andrew's free ebook at stockmarketpdf.com. You won't regret it. And I'm going to save the best one for last. Just and I think, you know, if you're listening to this and this all sounds like kind of common sense to you, I would really implore you just listen to the end or you know, I'll just talk about it now because maybe one of the biggest things I, I see when I'm online and somebody asks for advice from anybody and a lot of people tend to chime in and they'll say that you should just buy an index ETF and be and be done with it. Now, you know, I I personally try to buy individual stocks and I talk about it a lot and there are reasons behind why I personally buy individual stocks over ETFs and that those are you know well thought out um, theories and reasons and and their historical facts behind that, this and that, and and I'm playing to my strengths, all these sorts of things. However, I don't think that that advice in of itself is bad. Um, It is good advice and it can help a lot of people and it's a way a lot of people should invest. However, there's a lot of problem with just saying, here, here's a solution, now go away. Because while investing has kind of a lot conceptually to to digest, especially when you're first starting out, 
how you actually behave when things get tough is, is going to have a much larger impact on your results. So if I go back to what I was talking about, about businesses being around, and if you look at something as simple as the average S&P 500 return over the last, let's say, 90 years, that's hovered around 9 to 10, maybe 11% per year, depending on what time period you're looking at. But over decades and decades and decades, it's been close to this 10% a year has been the stock market average return. The key there is that while you do try to buy low and sell high, you know, you try to buy companies that are cheap and sell companies that get expensive, nobody's perfect at it. And the key to getting at least 10% returns is holding on through the long term. And that means being invested, yes, when the market is good, but also when the market is bad. Because there's plenty of studies and, and you can go through and kind of run some tests yourself and do some number experiments and see what will happen. But if you were only ever invested when the market's in the bull market, you would miss a substantial portion of the gains that happen over the decades because a lot of gains happen during a recovery. And you know you want to be adding more money and buying more stocks when stocks are depressed because those are when they're at great deals and you know that they won't stay depressed forever. And so when they finally do pop up, it's usually... A, you'll get a, a huge return from that. And B, most people usually aren't in there yet, which is why it's by definition depressed. And so a lot of people get in too late and they miss out. And, and that does make up a big portion of returns over the long term. So you want to be completely invested. You want to hold and you want to hold regardless of whether the market's doing good or if it's doing bad. And so... When people don't get that context or that that kind of lesson in there, and we just tell you, hey, you know, index and just buy and hold. It's like, okay, cool, yeah, whatever. You fast forward maybe 10 years and they see their portfolio drop in half and they don't understand everything I just said right now, such as, you know, the market has averaged this much over this amount of time. The things that I try to say over and over again about the market, how it, it cycles like the seasons and how you know we have spring, summer, winter, and fall, and it's not like during winter we think there'll never be a summer again. Winter still sucks, but we know that eventually there will be a summer again, and the market's the same way. So there's all these kind of little things and these little facts and reassurances that, I mean, yeah, I, I kind of broke it down here in, in this little episode, but really it's something that you absorb over time and and a little bit here and there can really help you build your resolve during times where you really need to hold your stocks and let them ride out the storm so they can recover when recovery happens. And you know, these, these bear markets and these tough times, they happen for years. And uh, I mean, even you could argue from 2009 to like 2012, even during 2012, some people thought the world was going to end. They thought governments were going to collapse and, and there, you had the preppers and all, all these people really freaking out. And so it's really hard for people to hang on that long, but it's something that you study the history of the stock market enough. You understand how it works. You understand how businesses work. You understand what earnings mean and, and what assets mean and how the market works and how economies work, all these sorts of things. And all these kind of pieces of evidence you can build can really help you stay invested when it matters most and it's just so so crucial and you know there's there's so many other things that you learn as you go along your way and so that's why i think investing resources in general are so important to be consumed by not only people who are interested and people who want to buy individual stocks but even the people who want to be passive the people who just want to buy set and forget you know, unless they have extreme discipline or they literally just don't even care about their money and, and, and can just shut that part off of their brain for 40 years, you know, chances are you're going to need at least enough of a base of an education to be able to understand what's happening with your money, how to set up the best system to at least let it go passive, and then how to be able to weather the temptation to to kind of sell out or or try to stray away from these proven principles. And so 
it, 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 again, I think I've hammered it down enough, but it's it's just something that more people need to hear. And I hope that beginners that are, are getting in are hearing this message and, and they're not, you know, slaving 40 hours a week every year of their life only to watch it, you know, what, kind of watch it slip through your fingers when you don't have just basic financial basic money, basic investing advice and and how to make your money kind of move forward from that. Another piece of bad advice. I mean, this isn't so much bad advice, but maybe it's a way you can take some good kind of action pieces a little too far. I think it's obvious if, if you want to create more money for yourself, limiting your expenses really helps with that. And it gives you more, available to be able to invest creating a budget tends to work for a ton of people i know it's worked for me to open up more money to put into the stock market problem with budget is getting into like a budget hell where you might not you know you might squeeze your budget so short that you completely suck any enjoyment out of your life whatsoever i think a lot of us kind of do this initially when we first get into personal finance. I know I certainly did, but I learned over time and just chill out, relax. It's going to happen. You know, wealth's going to be built eventually and anyways. So you got to enjoy the journey along the way. And I think if you make it too restrictive and too kind of gung ho, especially at the beginning, you're not going to build sustainable habits and you're not going to see results over the long term. And kind of piggybacking off of that, I think something that I know I do and I know a lot of people do as well is they'll they'll track their net worth on a spreadsheet. And I think in general, it's a good thing to do, but you just have to be careful not to take it overboard. Because as the market moves, that net worth number that you're looking at moves as well. And so again back to the discussion of well if we hit a bear market if the stock market crashes if it loses 25 to 50% now all of a sudden we feel like we're backtracking instead of moving forward when in reality you know if you're doing the things we talk about your dollar cost averaging you're buying shares every month your wealth is actually growing you just can't see it right now but you're accumulating more assets you're accumulating more pieces of these businesses you're growing your business portfolio you know you know so to say and so you're you're growing invisible wealth, but on paper, it looks like you're losing. And that can be really disheartening and it, it, it could make you do something extreme. It could make you quit. It could do any of those sorts of things. So I think it's really important to, if you're going to track your net worth, make sure you understand this key concept that it's only helpful to a degree. Um, and I'd say it's much more helpful at showing you how you're paying off debt rather than like, how much money you actually have. And, you know, I think putting more of a focus on accumulating assets rather than watching your balances grow is, is really, really key. If, if you want to put your mind at ease when it comes to being on this financial freedom path. And I guess the last piece of advice I'll kind of dispel in a way on this episode is I guess just be careful when you meet the people who are really raw, raw market, raw, raw, like, you know, the kind of typical stereotypical wall street follows the tickers, knows all the technical terms, has a lot of charts in their life. Right. And, and really kind of lives and breathes the market and then really studies the market. They probably can make a lot of money. Maybe they do. But when you talk about all the principles that we always hammer down on the podcast, when you talk about being part owner of a business and, and again, building that business portfolio, you really don't care what happens in the market too much. And I think it's easy to be kind of suckered into the whole game of the stock market and there's more there's much more to the stock market than what the stock market presents on the surface you know it, it seems to present things that you hear about on CNBC and and things that can really start to make you feel like you don't have a chance that you can compete 
you know, you have these algorithms now that are these computers that are trading and, and they're doing it automatically and they're manip- you know, they're they're trying to take advantage of volume and, and like getting little half percents of a of of a penny kind of arbitrage and, and doing those sorts of deals just millions of times to to make a little bit of money. And then you have a lot of people who like to claim that they can I don't know why it's still so prevalent, but you, you always have people who like to make these price targets. You know, there's a price target for this stock, there's a price target for Bitcoin, there's a price target for the market. And it's it's just so ridiculous, especially when you're talking about the the stock market as a whole. If you're talking about the S and P five hundred, you're talking about the Dow. Uh, I don't like to put people on blast like individually, but one's particularly coming to my mind where he's written books calling this about the Dow, calling that number on the Dow and, and just been completely and utterly wrong. I think he got maybe one out of five predictions right. And now he thinks he's like the smartest guy alive and he got some publicity after that. But there's just so many people like that. And, and there's so many just so much focus on the wrong things, you know, yeah, the stock market creates liquidity. It's a place where a lot of money flows in and out very quickly on the day-to-day basis. It's very exciting. There's ringing bells. There's flashing tickers, all these sorts of things. But at the end of the day, at its very core, it is a marketplace. And it is comprised of businesses that are actually making money in the real world. You know, Aside from the whole Wall Street financial kind of make money off commissions and make money by moving money and all these things. There's, there's actual money, actual businesses doing real things that matter in the world. And so when we approach it that way, then we can really do a better job at picking the right stocks and picking the right businesses that are doing well on when you look at the business and they're doing well from a business perspective rather than just a share price perspective. And that's huge. And and I think that really helps you. And it's kind of like the next logical step in, in what we're talking about today is taking this bad advice, turning it into good advice, and maybe going the next step into adding principles and and fundamentals and things that investors over and over and over again have used over the years and decades to create wealth doing that and then again navigating through the weeds and filtering out the bad noise and finding the good parts of the stock market and finding the businesses that will continue to pay you parts of their profits for years and years and years and that will grow and as the business grows you will grow and that's how you'll make money so keep those things in mind really try to take everything that comes at you with a grain of salt Try to get the perspective of the person who's talking to you. What What is their perspective? What is their experience? Is what they're saying make sense or does it just sound nice? And avoid the ones that we talked about today. And now you know how to avoid them, why to avoid them. And you can go save all your friends and family too. All right. Well, that's going to wrap us up this week. I hope it was helpful and hopefully you learned something and hopefully you are going to be pushed in the right direction. This is going to push you forward on your path to financial freedom. So you can always check us out online. Um, Dave and I are on Twitter. We have our email lists. Obviously, you can read the show notes if you need to. Leave a comment if you want on the show notes. Investingforbeginners.com slash podcast. Actually had a nice comment from my uh, on one of our recent episodes, and he talked about I just kind of I want to share what he said because it was it was kind of cool to hear some of the takeaways he had from the show and and kind of where he's his along his journey and it's something that you can maybe apply for yourself. I mean, for one, he's talking about how he's reading One Up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch, which I'm currently reading too, and it's a fantastic book and it's really short. And it's a great intro onto the markets. It's from Ed. He goes, hi, I've been listening to your podcast for a while now, but never took the opportunity to subscribe to your mailing list. But I just subscribed today. I can tell you really 
I can tell you, I really enjoyed this last podcast. I'm new to investing with very small positions, but learning something new every single day. At first, as new investors, we don't understand how this works and we want profits fast and consistently without putting in the time or the effort to understand how the market works. I can relate to Andrew's opinion to take profit and forget about the stock, not get attached. As Peter Lynch would say, the stock doesn't even know you own it. Thanks for your knowledge and keep it up. Well, thank you, Ed. If anybody else wants to leave a comment, feel free. I know I love to reply to you guys and, and talk to you guys on there and hear your thoughts from these podcast episodes. And, you know, Ed summed it up really nicely. He said, we all want profits fast without putting in the time and effort to understand how the market works. And so something we should all try not to do because it's, even if you do get the profits, it could be very unsustainable and you probably won't have nice long-term results from it. So go out there, get more knowledge, buy some stocks, grow your wealth. Invest with a margin of safety, emphasis on the safety, and we'll talk to you guys next time. We hope you enjoyed this content. Seven Steps to Understanding the Stock Market shows you precisely how to break down the numbers in an engaging and readable way with real-life examples. Get access today at stockmarketpdf.com. Until next time, have a prosperous day. The information contained is for general information and educational purposes only. It is not intended for a substitute for legal, commercial, and or financial advice from a licensed professional. Review our full disclaimer at einvestingforbeginners.com.